And I invite you to remain standing as you are able for the reading of the Scripture, which comes from Matthew's Gospel, the last chapter of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. Hear, therefore, in these words of Matthew, the Great Commission. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mount to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God, and you may be seated. And as you're being seated, will you please thank Rhonda Piccolo and the bell choir for leading us in worship this morning? <laughs> they've been here for three services. They've done a great job. Not only are they wonderful musicians, they may be the bravest musicians in town today because for three hours they've been holding highly conductive metal objects above their head uh, during the lightning storms around here. So we appreciate their courage as well as, as, well as their wonderful music. Well, grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning. God is good. And all the time, I'm Charles Anderson. It's my privilege to share God's word with you, hopefully in God's way, as we continue to look at some top text of the Bible, uh, scriptures which are memorable for us, that have meaning to us. We'll be looking at the Great Commission today. I'm grateful for your participation. Grateful for you being here on such a stormy day. Uh, days like this are strange and wondrous occasions inside, inside of churches. We've had power outages. We've lost the, the lights in here a couple of times. We, we had the sound system go in and out. We had to reboot the computers. Just all sorts of wonderful and strange things. At the first hour this morning, at the 8.15 hour, I was walking into the foyer and three staff members were there, Dr. Paul Parks and uh, Reverend Pastor Mike Schultz and Rich Holt, our outreach director. And as I walked in, all three of their phones went, eh, 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 which meant two things. Number one, we had some really bad weather around us. And number two, they had not turned off their telephones like they were supposed to. However, Dr. Paul Parks, being the quick wit that he is, was able to keep the ball from touching the ground. He was able, they fumbled it, but they caught it before they touched the ground. He turned and said, oh my goodness, we were hoping we wouldn't, that you'd never find out that we had a Charles Alert app. And so uh, that'll be available on, I, on iTunes immediately after the service, service today. You're here. And whatever is going on outside, God is good inside because you're here. And I praise God and I thank God for you. So let's pray. Dear God, may the words of my mouth, may the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. And if, in the words of this one, we hear not the voice of God, then please speak to each of us in the quietness of our own hearts. Amen. It was graduation weekend at Texas A&M University. I just thought I'd get a whoop from somebody in here. I did the first couple of hours. Texas A&M University, I was the pastor at our university church there in College Station. And a young man who also was a member of the Corps of Cadets asked me to do his wedding. So on graduation weekend, Friday morning of graduation weekend, he receives his commission into the Marine Corps. One o'clock that same afternoon, we do his wedding rehearsal. Seven o'clock that very same evening, he graduates from A&M. Eleven o'clock the very next morning, we do his wedding. The last time I saw him was at one o'clock that Saturday afternoon, as he and his new bride were driving off to Camp Lejeune, where he had orders to report on Monday morning. I tell you, that boy left us a changed man. When we sent him out of there, 
We sent them out of there. Commission, commencement, commandment, the whole thing. But I want to ask you if you can remember a time when you yourself were sent out. When you were sent out, that charged up. That changed. You'd been one person, but then you got some orders in your life. You were commissioned, you were commenced, you were commanded. And it totally changed who you are and where you were going. And you left charged up and changed. Can you remember a time when you were that charged up? Because you were sent. The reason I say that is, in the scripture we read this morning, that's exactly what Jesus is attempting to do for you. Here in the last words of Jesus in Matthew, we meet some lasting words called the Great Commission. That's what the church has called this for hundreds of years, the Great Commission. But you could also call it just as easily the Great Commencement because it sounds a lot like that. After all, you have been to high school graduations. You've been to college graduations for your children and your grandchildren. Some of you have been professors and had to attend how many commencement graduation exercises. And you know how these work. It's an ending time. It's a sending time. Just last weekend, we're grateful that Kit Tomlinson preached in here because Lydia and I were up at Tech. We were up at Texas Tech seeing Katie graduate with her master's degree. And being part of that commencement, that graduation exercise, reminded me what goes into a commencement. And that includes the commencement speech. Now, you know what a commencement speech is. It's usually an ending and sending word, kind of a last word on all things that are important. Some guest speaker, some notable celebrity usually gets up and says, after all the classes and assignments you've had here, if you've not learned anything else, then please remember this. And then they give you the secret of life. You're sitting there after four years of tuition payments and saying, why didn't someone just tell me this at the beginning and save me four years? But a good commencement word ends something and sends someone. It's the last word on all things important. For instance, I remember when Garrison Keillor did a commencement address one time entitled, Making the Perfect Hamburger. That was the title of his commencement address, Making the Perfect Hamburger. And for 15 minutes, Garrison Keillor talked about shaping the patty, firing up the coals, slicing the lettuce, and putting the mayonnaise always on the bottom half of the bun. Kind of unusual, but the students, the graduates, all got his message, namely that some of life's best joys are actually life's simplest joys. That's not a bad ending and sending word. That's not a bad last word on all things important. Well, what's the most memorable commencement that you can recall? What's that most memorable commencement speech, that most memorable last word, that ending sending word you can remember? I remember my own high school graduation. My own high school graduation, we're in the stadium at at the high school, time for the commencement address, the speaker got up, came to the podium, I think he was a pastor. He looked out over the podium, he looked at us, the student body, and he said, seniors, I know you all are so excited about graduating right now that you will not remember a thing I said five minutes after I'm finished. But please, Please, if you can take anything that I say from this night, please take this with you. And he took out an apple, kind of like this one here. He took out an apple. He held it up in front of us. And he said, seniors, from this day on, the rest of your life, every time you see an apple, I want you to remember one thing. And that one thing I always want you to remember is, and for the life of me, I've forgotten what he said, (laughs) but I have never forgotten that stupid apple. Well, a good commencement word should end something and send someone. It should be a good last word 
on what's important. Now you listen to these words of Jesus in the Great Commission this morning and you hear that kind of word. You hear that kind of word. Jesus says, go, make disciples. These are Jesus' ending words. They end his words in Matthew. They end his time on earth. They end his public ministry. And they end his conversation with the disciples. These are his ending words. But please notice they're also his sending words as well. Because the first word he says is what? Go. Go therefore. Make disciples. The first word on the last word for Jesus is go. And in this commencement that Jesus is all about, we don't get a diploma. We get an assignment. We get sent. We get a go. Which really shouldn't surprise me when I remember that go is God's favorite verb. Go is God's favorite verb. Just think about it for a moment. Almost every time that God speaks to God's people, it ends with a go. For instance, in Genesis, in Genesis, the salvation story of creation begins when God says to an aged Abraham and Sarah, Go to a land I will show you. In Exodus, Exodus, freedom begins. Freedom begins when God says to Moses, you go to Pharaoh and say to Pharaoh, let my people, what? Let my people go. In Luke's gospel, Jesus ends the Good Samaritan by saying, go, do likewise. In Luke's gospel, hope begins when Jesus says to some disciples of John the Baptist, go, go. And tell what you have seen and heard. In Mark's gospel, do you realize in Mark's gospel, Easter, Easter itself begins with an angel saying, Go, tell the disciples and Peter that he is going before you. Even Easter has a go in it. And then Matthew, Matthew, our future, your future and mine begins when, when Jesus says, Go, make disciples. Whenever God speaks to God's people, it almost always includes a go. In fact, we are commanded in the Bible, in the Bible we are commanded to go some 200 times. We are only commanded to stay 13 the score, go 200, stay 13. And every one of those commands to stay are actually to wait so that Jesus can tell us how to better go. Because apparently, Jesus is the God of go. We follow him, but he sends us. Jesus Christ is the God of go. And if you have God in your life, then there you will have a going in your life. You'll have a command to go in your life. You will have somewhere in you a God-given go. A God-given command to get out and get beyond. Jesus never says, well, if you go, as if we have some option, some election, some choice about pushing on beyond our boundaries, beyond our comfort zone. Our future is not in retreating from life. It's in embracing life. And life with Jesus never is if you go. It's always now you go. Why is that? Why is go God's ending and sending word for my life? Well, maybe. Maybe it's because it's in going that we find adventure, that we find our Jesus adventure. That maybe it's in going where, we, where the action is. Je Jesus says, go, make, 
baptize, teach all the nations. It's like Jesus is saying, guys, I have placed all my chips on you. You are playing for really big stakes. So you go and you live a really big life. Maybe getting outside of ourselves is how we find God's appointed adventure, God's adventure for our lives. Maybe when we spend ourselves away for Jesus on some great cause, that's when we're protected from what I think is the biggest danger to the, Christ, to the Christian life, and that is boredom. Boredom. Sometimes the greatest threat to your faith is not sin, but boredom. You've become stale, musty. There's mildew on your spirit. Do you know what boredom is? Boredom is a little child sitting on the floor surrounded by pals and pals of toys and crying, I have nothing to do. Because even a child knows that activity is a poor substitute for adventure. Even a child knows that having all the toys in the world is a poor substitute for when you can go outside and hunt for treasure boredom. And I know a lot of really good Christians who are faithful, but they're bored. Because life is not made up of the toys you have. Life is made up of the treasure you hunt. But you got to get up and you got to get out to get into the game. I like the way Warren Bird puts it. Warren says, you and I serve a God who calls and sends us. He is not primarily interested in our comfort. Boy, that's a strong statement. Are you living more towards comfort or adventure? Because God, God's not frankly interested in, in our comfort. God's frankly interested in our salvation. And that includes saving us from our boredom. And so if... Scripture has become stale to you. If, if your faith has milled you in dust on it. And Christ, if Jesus just doesn't seem all that interesting anymore. Then I suggest you get up, get out, and get on with it. Because going is where you'll find your Jesus adventure. But even more than that, it's in the going that you will find your Jesus relationship. It's in going that you'll find the relationship you most want in your life. Jesus says, go and remember, I am with you always. Jesus says, go and I will go with you. I think that's really the point. I think that's what this is all about. I think that going is about growing the relationship we have with Jesus Christ. I think, about, I think that going into the world and going into the hopes, hurts, and needs of others has everything to do with how it is between us and Jesus Christ. It, it, we grow in the heart as we go into the world. Uh, Lydia and I have a, a dear friend right now, and a dear friend who, who told us this last couple of weeks, she has started dating again. She's our age. Her husband died about 20 months ago. She's been feeling pretty fragile since then. Some of you can, can relate to that. But she's kind of been testing her heart a bit recently. She met online, met a nice Christian man who lives a couple of towns over. They did, you know, the texting thing for a while. They talked on the phone a lot, shared stories about family, history, children. But you see, recent, recently the stakes have gotten a whole lot higher because they, she told us they have now started, and here's the phrase, going out. Do you remember going out? Do you remember asking the love of your life, but first go out? 
going out's important because relationships don't form if you don't go out and test them some. That's where love gets formed. I, I'm not sure. I think when Lydia and I were dating, I never said to her, Lydia, would you, would you like to engage in some relational development in a neutral but attractive setting? I don't think I said that. I may or may not have said, uh, Lydia, would you like to discover who we can be together as we share events in time? What I'm pretty sure I said was, would you please go out with me this weekend? Let's go out together. Because gang, you love forms and going out. Relationship is discovered and it's, and it's developed and it's deepened only by going out. You think Jesus might actually know this? Go and remember, I am with you always. Watch Jesus saying, how about this? Church, let's go out. Church, why don't you and I go out together? Here you and I had this relationship with Jesus and it's good and it's nice and it's real. But I promise you, we will never know how deep and developed that relationship could be if we never get outside of ourselves. Because relationships are developed and discovered and deepened as we go out. That's what Jesus means. Go and I will always be with you. Folks, there is hardwired into you. There's hardwired into your faith. There's hardwired into this church, this outside of ourselves orientation. It is a hardwired orientation that's always pushing us beyond our own self-interest and pushing us into the hurts and the needs of others and the world. It's always pushing us. And we do it. We follow it. We go out on it. Because we have a heart for other people, yes. But we also do it because we have a heart for Jesus. And we know that our hearts only grow as our hearts go. It, it's, like, it's like a dream that Will Campbell says he keeps having. The dream at night always starts, appears for him in some church at the conclusion of their worship hour as they're closing the worship hour. And in Will's denomination, in Will's practice denomination, his church, uh, they always close the service by having an evangelical uh, invitation where the preacher invites people who want to give their lives to Jesus to come walking down to the front to show their desire. Well, in Will's dream, his church is having this service. It's invitation time. Here come the people. But the preacher this time... The preacher says, why are you coming down to the front? Go to Jesus. Oh, why are you coming down towards me? Get out of here. You all go to Jesus. And the people who are coming down stop. And then they turn around. And they, they leave the sanctuary. And they get in their cars and they drive away. And then the preacher looks at the remaining congregation. And he says, well, why are you all hanging around here? Why don't you all go to Jesus? Why don't all of you get out of here and go find Jesus? Go to Jesus. And they all look at each other. They get up. They run out of the sanctuary. Five minutes, the parking lot's empty. Ten minutes later, the phone starts ringing off the hook at the police station. The first call is from the director of a local nursing home. She says, I think I need some police down here. Well, ma'am, why do you need some police down here? Well, there's a whole bunch of crazy people outside the door asking if they can come in and see Jesus. And I keep telling them that Jesus isn't in the nursing home. All we have are some old people who are half dead, but they keep saying, we want to see Jesus. Let us in so we can visit Jesus. The next call comes in. It's the prison warden. He says, I think I need some cops down here. Well, sir, why do you need some cops at the prison? There are a whole bunch of nutty people who are banging on the gate saying, please let us in so we can visit Jesus. We're here to see Jesus. And I keep telling them, you won't find Jesus in this prison. All you'll find are thugs, thieves, murderers, and repeat offenders. But they say, let us in so we can visit Jesus. As he hangs up the phone, it rings a third time. 
This time it's the superintendent of the state hospital. And she says, you won't believe it, but there's a whole crowd of nutty people outside asking to get into the state hospital. They say, we're here to see Jesus. Will you please let us in? Because we're trying to see Jesus. And I keep telling them, Jesus isn't in the hospital. All we have are people with nutty, broken lives. But they say, we're here to see Jesus. And Will, Will's dream that reminds me that if I want to go see Jesus, I'm going to have to go not only, to, I'm going to have to go to people whose lives are lived not only outside my walls, but I'm going to have to go to people whose lives are lived outside of my experience. I'm going to have to go to people whose lives are lived outside of my comfort zone. Some of you in this room, some of you in this room already do that by participating in our Kairos and Epiphany ministries in prison. Some of you already in this room already do that by being Stephen ministers and going into hospitals and nursing homes where a lot of people would be a little uneasy to go. Some of you already do it. You have found your God-given go by going down the hallway and working with special needs. People with developmental disabilities. Sweet to watch on screen, but some of us feel uncomfortable. We don't. Some of you have already found your go. If you're going to go to Jesus, with Jesus, for Jesus, it means going out outside of your walls outside of your personal experience and outside of your comfort zone because you'll encounter him there. Which is what God's favorite word, it's what his favorite verb is all about. God says, go. And if you have God in your life, I'm telling you, you have a go in your life. You have a God-given mission, a God-given service, a God-given people. You have a God-given go you're to serve somewhere in your life. It's where you're going to find your Jesus adventure, and I promise you it's where you'll find your Jesus relationship because Jesus Christ is the God of go. We follow him, but he sends us. Jesus Christ is the God of go go. And he only leaves us really two options. We either get in motion or we're just going through the motions. And frankly, I can think of no better ending or sending word than that.